Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today the bench we have some equipment, some controls, some data sheets, and hopefully we're going to have a good video. This video is coming up because I was talking to someone about doing some restoration restorations on some 400 series tech scopes and they made a very interesting point about a topic that's not really talked about too much and that is the difference between trimmers and controls and there is a very large fundamental difference between those two and it happens to be in lifespan um, he was mentioning that uh, there was a 400 series scope that he'd gotten and in the use case that that was in all of the trim pots had actually opened up after doing a little bit of digging I shouldn't say all I should say most most of the trim pots opened up after doing a little bit of digging, he found out that that scope had been under a heavy, heavy cal cycle. It was calibrated multiple times very, 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 very often. And the pots just wore out. Uh, they do, they, they actually absolutely can do that, which we'll get into in the data sheets here in a little bit. But um, the, trim, the difference between a trim pot and a control is actuation life. So how many times you can rotate the control and the control is guaranteed not to fail. Pretty much anything on the front panel of a properly engineered piece of equipment, and I'll put an asterisk there and come back to it, is anything on the front panel is going to be a control. So the position sensors, things like that, these are all going to be controls. They're designed to be turned regularly and often. Internally, for the calibration adjustments, those will tend to be a trimmer. They'll be smaller, definitely usually handle less wattage. So these trimmers are only half watt where these controls are two watt. And uh, same thing on some of this older vintage gear is the front knobs will always be on a control, while as the, ooh, that's nice and smooth, as the um, internals will be trimmers. If you're under a really heavy cal cycle, um, my understanding back in the day, we would actually send these out, and then when you sent out a scope for calibration, it was calibration and adjustment. Today, we don't actually follow that philosophy much anymore. And uh, absolutely, if anybody has anything to add, hit up the comments and let us know. But if you send something out to a cow house today, they will check that the unit is in specification. If it's in specification, unless you've requested adjustment, they're not going to touch it. They're just going to send it back and say, yep, inspect, everything's good to go. Um, you can actually request data where they'll actually tell you where it is in its specification. Uh, the cheapest alignment, because it takes the least amount of time, check it, make sure it's in spec. Green check, everything's good. You can get cow with data, tends to be a little bit more expensive. For example, I need to send it out because it's expired, but this is the 7510 that hides in the bench down low and is the most accurate meter that I currently have here in the lab. This meter does get sent it back out to Keithley and it does get checked. It is overdue uh, and I will be sending it out soon. Some things happened this year in 2024 and 2025 where I just, everything happened so fast I haven't had time to get it out and get it back. But we do need to get this one checked. So I don't need to send the 6500 out because I send the 7510 out. So what I can do then is use it as a transfer standard, take the measurements that I know this is good with, and then I can transfer voltages, currents, and resistances up to the 6500. And so I can check in, I can check the 6500, sanity check it, but when I need real precision, I have to use the 7510. These two meters look very, very similar, but they are not. They are in completely different uh, stability classes and things like that. To, uh, this is barely hitting the six and a half digit. It's good for six and a half digit, but it dithers a little bit. This is far, far more stable, but it also has to push one additional digit. And even the best meters that we have made today completely only go one more digit more past this. Eight and a half is about the best we've got right now without going to extreme lengths of measurement. So when I get the 7510 back, I get it back with data, and I'm actually logging this one on how it's doing. So I'll update that spreadsheet, and we'll go from there. But we're actually keeping track of how this meter is actually recording and doing things and 
keeping its stability over time, which is really what's important. And that's kind of why we've stopped adjusting equipment when we send it out for calibration. Because especially when you get into this class of equipment, the stability is what matters. And disturbing that stability is the last thing we want to do. So we're going to get deeper into that. I have some other really stable things that I need to add to the lab, especially since I have some of the um, DC supplies that we worked on here in a little bit. I do have a EDC I got to get back in front of the camera. This is an additional, this is a upcoming video. We're going to work on this 475A. You guys can see from the dust layer that uh, it needs some, needs a little bit of TLC. You, at least we're going to have to fix a broken position control. But so this 475 is up for the bench. Uh, we've got more precision DC stuff coming. So lots to hang around for. And if that's something that interests you, hit all the YouTube buttons and hang around. But back to controls. So, trimmers and controls. If we sent something out on a very, very heavy cal cycle, it is foreseeable that the trimmers and controls could reach their end of their rotational life. So as we can see, zooming in down here, the trimmers are much, much smaller than the controls. They tend to be a little bit cheaper, but I am seeing stuff. Uh, some of the rudimentary gear on some of the online websites are using trimmers where they should be using controls, and the, um, well, the controls are wearing out very, very quickly under normal use. So if we take a look at some data sheets, uh, these are actually both Borns pots. Uh, nothing against other potentiometer vendors. That's just what I happen to have in stock in the lab. And uh, they do tend to make a very high quality, uh, Borns tends to make a very, very high quality potentiometer. So, but if we take a look, so we have the controls over here and we have the trimmers over here. Uh, it is under, so you have load life, a little bit further down. You have load life, which is electrical characteristics, and then we have rotational life, which is how many times the control can be actuated before it's... You may get more than this, but this is the guaranteed actuation cycles. And on the trimmer, we only have 200 cycles, which is fairly f light for a control. If you can think how many times you've rotated the knob on a front panel or something like that. You could very easily exceed 200 cycles in a short time. Whereas the rotational life on the control is 15,000 cycles. That's specifically just for this control. I've seen some industrial controls. That gets into the hundreds, thousands, 200,000s, 300,000s of cycles and actuations. So some of this stuff can get really, really, really durable. Price goes up accordingly, but we can get there. However, at only 200, 200 actuations, under a heavy cal cycle, which these scopes are now pushing 60 years old, absolutely you could hit that. One of the things you can tell is as you're doing an alignment and you kind of get a feel for these things after you've done a few of them, I can tell when I'm doing an adjustment, it'll be smooth and then it'll kind of get a little weird and then it'll be smooth again. And it's right there where it got a little weird where the uh, track is starting to wear out. So it's the, the control is very nearing its end of life, and I have to be very careful. Or you'll get a control that's completely worn out. You'll turn it, and nothing happens. Most of the time, in a 400 series scope, what will happen is that will affect either the vertical board or the horizontal board. That's where most of the trimming is actually done. So what will happen is um, the scope may be actually be down on bandwidth. It's kind of counterintuitive because the vertical section on one of these scopes is resonant to get the speed out. So if the caps are gone, we only have the inductors and you'll actually lose bandwidth. So where typically capacitance will slow a circuit down because these, this is LRC resonant, removing the capacitor changes the resonant aspect of the vertical channel and actually will slow the scope down. So you'll see missing bandwidth. Um, you'll go to tweak a control, nothing will happen. You might see too much bandwidth if one of the capacitors is shorted out. Not not too much bandwidth, a very slow bandwidth. Having the high frequency compensation misadjusted in one of these scopes, you can be down 40 megahertz, uh, easily 40 megahertz 
off of the top end bandwidth. So those uh, caps are fairly critical in the in the uh, vertical channel, horizontal channel. It's a little slower, but um, definitely in the vertical, it's very very sensitive to the inductance and capacitance going down the amplification chain. So I hope that helps and demystifies the trimmers versus controls a little bit. As always, if you guys have any questions, hit me up in the comments below. I read all the comments in between videos. A huge thank you to the patrons and members to the YouTube channel that help keep this channel going and help keep the lights on and videos coming up to YouTube. As always, your help is greatly appreciated. And if you like what you see and you find this helpful, hit the subscribe button, hang around. More is always on the way. And I will see everybody in the next video. Bye for now.